It's no secret that I've always really liked the K5. I don't know why, it always just seems to work out really well. Unfortunately, my old one wasn't running so good due to some damage that was inflicted upon it, and so I had to build a new one, and that's what we're going to have a look at right now. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and today we're going to have a look at my new K5. Now, this was originally meant to be a segment of the Odds and Sods video that I will get round to doing, and I started work on it, but everything just came out, it came out way too long, and I had to start cutting things down, mostly this, and so there just wasn't enough detail, I thought, so I figured it was best to do this as its own thing, and then we can go into more detail on other things that are in there. So I think that'll work out better. Anyways, if you're not familiar with the K5, it's a Pentium class processor, so similar performance bend, but it's fairly different internally. Whilst it does fit in the same socket, the socket 5 processors, it's not really much the same. It's actually a RISC 8 6 implementation, a lot like the next gen 586, though in this case it uses an AMD 29K core. Anyway, I could probably stand here and talk about it all day, but there's not really much point in that. I think I've said everything I need to say for the start of this, so we might as well just go and actually have a look at the thing now, as, well, it would be a bit daft if I didn't, given the purpose of this thing, wouldn't it? So here is my new AMD K5. It lives in a different case to the old one, but the layout of everything's really similar. It's made by another company, so it's not a MyTac chassis. The build quality may be a little better, but it still comes off as being relatively cheap, which is fine, it's doing its job. At the front, it really doesn't look out of the ordinary, which suits me. You'll probably recognise the Matsushita CD writer from my Pentium 66. Eventually I'll put a new Yamaha drive in here and return the Matsushita to the Pentium, probably once I've covered the really old one that's in there at the moment in some other video sometime. We already know what this Matsushita does, so I won't be covering it again here, it pretty much has its own video, so yeah. Around the back, a trend I will notice, the system contains some less common parts. I'm sure the Win TV Cinema Pro sticks out like a sore thumb, but again, we already know what that does, so there's no need to go over it again. We discussed it at decent length in the Win TV Celebrity video. You may notice the sound card does have gold plating, and we do have a SCSI card, so we're really not messing around this time. Under the hood, the machine doesn't have a lot of room left, as we've populated pretty much everything. The motherboard is quite large, and it doesn't use cursed modules for the external cache, instead using the older DIP SRAM chips like 486 boards did. I have 512k installed, but I'll probably change it back down to 256k at some point, as I don't have that much RAM installed in this thing, and we will lose a fraction of a point in most benchmarks with the extra cache installed. It is literally a fractional amount. You, you wouldn't notice it in the real world, but it's something worth bearing in mind, and these chips aren't so easy to find. They'll probably go to better use somewhere else, which is probably when I'll take them out. They'll stay there until they're needed elsewhere, basically. I mean, I, I can't see any reason to hurry to take them out. This board has white ISA slots, and we have seen those before, haven't we? Well, there were only two companies, which I know of, that did this. Those being ECS and PC chips. Oddly, the latter was bought by ECS in later years, but had nothing to do with them at this stage, as far as I know. Still, yeah, well, we have seen white slots here before, on my old K5, using an ECS TR5510 AIO motherboard. And that's not a coincidence, because this is an ECS SI55P AIO. It's a board which seems to be around the same age. Their model numbers are actually somewhat descriptive, but also a little counterintuitive. The TR5510 actually uses an Intel 430FX, or Triton chipset, despite the fact it has the SIS model in its model number. Meanwhile, the SI55P 
uses a SIS 5510 series. I wonder if they swapped the model numbers of the board by accident. It seems to be the first two letters that denote the chipset, but yeah, the numbering is... it could throw you off. Either way, this is the same chipset used in my Pentium 66, and also on a TMC board I had running a Pentium 75 years ago, before sort of becoming my first K5, just before the battery leakage got out of hand and killed it. I always missed this board. But let me tell you, this one's just as good. Interestingly, my old K5 filled the role of that system, so between the TMC and the white slotted ECS stuff, yeah, we've sort of come full circle here. It's a shame I never properly documented the PC chip's M520 incarnation, because that thing was really good, but much like the TR5510, I kept having reliability problems. Though there's plenty of stuff left behind by it, including a playthrough of Dark Forces, so I suppose it's better to have used the hell out of it and never documented it than to have documented it but never used it. And really, it's not the board's fault. Before you go discounting the PC chips M520, it's actually a fantastic board, and I had it all working really well, but it took damage when I moved house, and I never could quite get it running right again. It was a shame, I would quite happily still be using it, but... Hey, this thing's actually a very good replacement. So, still, if you see an M520, don't discount it for it being a PC chips board. It is actually okay. Observant viewers who follow me around the internet like creepy stalkers might have realised that there was actually another instance of the K5 between the M520 and SI55P. Its configuration was very similar to this one, only the sound card wasn't properly repaired yet and the motherboard as well as hard drive were both completely scrapped parts. That system existed for just one purpose, to record my shoddy covers of Banjo-Kazooie music for the second channel. Yeah, we never did see the insides, but that system did exist. It was kind of sad when it came time to dismantle it, but I guarantee you this Chaintech 5 VGM is a fairly unreliable board now thanks to the store it came from being run by an incompetent prick who damaged it somehow, namely installing power supplies incorrectly. He was a real con artist. Otherwise, it's actually a very good board. It is also one of the boards I've earned the longest. In fact, I earned it before I built that 486SX. I just didn't have enough parts to hand to make a working system with it in 2004, hence said 486. And besides, I don't know how reliable it would have turned out. It's one of those things, though, where you have to wonder what effect it might have had if things went just a little bit differently. A year on an unstable Pentium class system would surely have been more comfortable than a year on an unstable 486DX33 as it was at that time. Although I doubt if we ever actually used the floating point capabilities. I would like to really stress though, as I have already, that otherwise the Chaintech 5 VGM is actually a very good motherboard, so if you spot a working one, it is worth having. Because unlike the SI55P here, it's a true socket 7 motherboard and it can run dual voltage CPUs. The M520 also can do this, but it needs an external voltage regulator module as some boards do. I think even the SI55P had an option for it as it does have the solder pads, but yeah, there's, there's no header there to plug a volt reg in. And the chain tech really just takes the cake because it doesn't need one. You just use jumpers on the motherboard and it works without any additional hardware. So the expansion cards in this thing. Following them from bottom to top we have the WinTV Cinema Pro and I already covered it in the WinTV Celebrity video as we know so you can go and catch up on that if you're really curious. 
because being curious is good. You can have a lot of fun. Above that is a murder, and I do use this if the DSL goes out. It's quite useful, and there are a couple other novel things it can do, but yeah, it's basically just a murder. It does murder things, it works in Windows 95, it doesn't even need special drivers. It, it just looks like another COM port to the machine with a murder stuck to it. Next is the Terratech Maestro 3296, and I will take this out of the board for you to show you it properly. I got this in rough shape. It wasn't working thanks to some dead capacitors and strangely broken crystals, which took a while to figure out. Honestly, I've never seen that happen anywhere before. Also, something had been spilt on the board which was difficult to remove, and it caused all kinds of weird behaviour. It also seems to have damaged the solder mask slightly, as this discoloration on the back. It looks dirty, doesn't it? You'll notice all the other cards in here are shiny and clean. Well, this one is clean, but it just looks like that, no matter what I do. I think it might have gotten in there. It may have contaminated it somehow. So, hopefully that doesn't do any damage long term. It's quite an interesting colour, actually. It's... It's more chocolatey. It's lighter than, say, the Ordigi 2 or Soundblast Alive. Still, on the upside, this one didn't require a known Terratech sanctioned capacitor mod to be done. Some of them will lock the system up and you have to replace a capacitor because Terratech spec'd it wrong or something, I can't remember now. You'll surely be able to spot that the card uses a crystal audio codec, which operates like any other crystal audio codec of this type, really. It will even run with the standard drivers from Crystal, but you'll lose some of the card's features doing that. The card has a second MIDI interface on board, and that hooks into this Dream Sam chip, which is a rather impressive wavetable we had in a video demonstration I did of it. To summarise briefly, if you don't want to look that video up right now, here are a few clips of it in action. But anyway, this wavetable hooks into the crystal's auxiliary input directly. It appears to be mostly GS and GM compatible, and at least everything I've done with it up to now has worked just fine. It also claims to have an MT32 mode, but I've never used that. There are apparently two sound sets on this board at 2 megs each for a total of 4 megabytes of ROM, which is actually quite impressive. I believe that's at least double the sound canvas. It can also drive the wavetable header independently of the SAM chip. Interestingly, you can select which one of these will be hooked up to the rear MIDI port, and it will echo MIDI input without loading any applications, so you could plug a controller keyboard in and just start playing with it, or else hook another PC up to it that didn't have its own wavetable, and have it echo from the SAM or a daughter card, which is neat. Essentially, you could just use it as a MIDI module from something else. Be warned, the MIDI 1 cannot transmit SysX data, so if you want to use the rear port to drive something that needs this, you'll have to map it to MIDI 2. The software is actually pretty good, and it lets you fiddle with things like that. The only issue I have 
is how it isn't always obvious what to do when first setting the card up, and things might appear to work but then do nothing if the resources aren't right. Generally one of the MIDI devices will do nothing, uh, will exhibit strange behaviour, or they'll appear to be swapped around. It's a little bit weird, you just sort of have to feel your way around in the dark. It's easy to say it's easy, but I think it's probably one of those cases of it's easy when you know how. Also, the same executable is used for Windows and DOS, but the DOS mixer values are stored separately and are used for DOS applications running in a Windows session, so you will have to adjust those volume levels beforehand as you won't be able to change them again from within Windows, because the Windows mixer values are separate and the TerraTech executable to change them simply loads up the Windows mixer. Meanwhile, the Crystal codec doesn't have the best Sound Blaster Pro compatibility. It's generally passable and it usually works, but as with any clone, there's always going to be applications that don't work very well with it. Also, the FM emulation is a bit strange. It is acceptable for the most part, though. I don't mind it, it's just, it's not bad, it's just different, but I can understand if you didn't like the inaccuracies of it at all. I don't mind, it makes a bit of a change. Interestingly, the FM sound does come from the sound chip and not the crystal, but yes, I'd recommend this card more for late DOS games with general MIDI support, or for use in Windows 95, because it's a really awesome piece of kit for that sort of stuff if you can get your hands on one. I suppose we should hear it in hover, eh? I always loved this song, man. I really should learn it someday. That sort of seems like it'd be quite easy. Here, have some more. I'm feeling generous.
to work. This card does have most of its inputs and outputs available as internal headers, including both MIDI interfaces, the inputs and outputs at the back, and of course the bog standard things such as CD-ROM input and the wavetable. And it does have an interface for an IDE CD-ROM drive at the back of the card though, which I'm not using here because this system's scuzzy. Going up from the Terratech, there's a VGA card, a Diamond Stealth 3D using an original S3 Varge 325 chip. I actually really like the Varge, they just work. I don't think this one will stay though, it was put here after I thought the Mac 64 was slow, and I was kind of sad because I wanted to use a Mac 64 in here, more if only for variety, but it turns out LBA2 just doesn't like this machine very much and there's not really any discernible difference anywhere that I've seen as yet. That and the NVP1100 MPEG accelerator won't work here. I think the WinTV might be the cause as it had its own MPEG card option and the bit for that add-on is been flipped by the diamond drivers somehow it seems, so who really knows? As there's no real advantage to using the Vargin here and the ATI acceleration whilst less powerful did work just fine as this thing's actually nearly fast enough to decode such things in software anyway so a little bit of assistance is enough. I probably will go back to the Mac 64 soon, because I'd like to have an ATI running, and my new K6 is probably going to be using an Nvidia card, while the Pentium 2 would use a Matrox if I could ever finish it. Oh, did I just mention a K6? Forget I said anything. Anyway, yeah, I'll probably be able to run LBA2 super smooth on a certain other system, so I'm not entirely worried about this issue anymore. It's kind of odd, isn't it, how the MVP1100 actually sits exactly in line with the ISA slot below. That tends to happen in electronics, the pitches of components are pretty standard. Interesting, it would not do that for the Trio 64V+, Plus, which I have in the Pentium 66. It seems Diamond used board-to-board -board interconnects that have a slightly higher footing on them, and it raises the MPEG decoder farther away from the GPU. These things do get quite hot, so that seems like a good idea. I'll actually tell you a story. I did something very stupid, which is the only reason I have another MVP1100. Actually, this might be the one from my Pentium 66. Yeah, I broke it. Uh, I wasn't sure what went wrong. It was when I was installing the TV card, and I just couldn't get it to work anymore. And I was like, yeah, no, this is horrible. And so I managed to get another Diamond uh, MVP1100. And I managed to get another Diamond Stealth Video 2001, and it didn't fix the problem. It turned out I'd just changed the PCI interrupt to an invalid setting, and yeah, that was quite an expensive uh, discovery of that nothing was wrong in the first place. But hey, I had some PCI cards that I've had for years that were going a little bit flaky, they were only ever used as test cards and they were sort of all I had left to the point that they'd gone into service and it wasn't something I wanted to do, so yeah, this stuff, it, it, I'm not considering it a waste because it's going to get used, I, I was running short anyway, my, my trash cards were sort of, yeah, it, this thing's a good card and so it'll replace a not very good card somewhere else. Once more, moving up from the video card, we have a network card. It's a network card, a 3COM905, and that's it. It's not special in any way at all. It just does network stuff, which is good, because I want to connect the system to a network. Yeah, go figure. Why would I want it to do that? It basically went in, got detected by Windows, and just worked. So I absolutely cannot complain about this peripheral at all. Above that is the Adaptex SCSI card, it's a 2940UW, ultra wide, I believe that means, which is a card everyone seems to use when they do PCI SCSI, and that's not really without good reason either, they just seem to do what they're supposed to do. They're nothing that fancy in the grand scheme of things, but they work well. I do have a 2940UW Pro that I nearly used, but I doubt it would make any difference. It was just the cheapest card on eBay on the day, and where it was supposed to be installed never worked out. 
it's basically the same card but with a couple of extra bells and whistles and it will be used anywhere just somewhere else in fact i already have something lined up for it at the time of recording this under the power supply is a stash of 32 megabytes of edo ram honestly that's enough for a k5 we could go farther but there'd be no point still 256k of cash should be correct for this in right back mode so you can probably see why I'm happy to drop that back, as this board doesn't do pipeline burst cache, and I don't need more RAM. In fact, I dare say this is generally overkill for Windows 95. You may have noticed that these ECS boards do have a PS2 header. I'm not using it, and I don't know the pinout, but we could quite easily reverse engineer it, because there are vias for a PS2 mouse port, so we could just bell it out with a continuity tester, but... My mice are mostly serial, so I've got no incentive to connect it. Before we finish with the board, it's probably worth noting that the CPU front side bus is only rated for between 50 MHz and 66 MHz on this board, so you won't be plugging one of those Cyrix chips that have the 75 or 83 MHz bus speed into it. You could probably use a 50, 60, 66 MHz one, I believe it does support those. You might actually be able to get higher or lower clocks through undocumented jumper settings, but don't expect it to work well, and I'm doubtful the SIS 5510 was really rated to go any faster. It's probably worth noting that the K5 CPU I have installed is the exact same one as my old system. I've not changed the chip at all. There's just no point, given it still works fine. They're bloody fast processors when they want to be the K5. I, I absolutely love them. People always tell me to install a 3DFX card, and to you I say where. I mean, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. I'm, I'm using all the slots on the back plane, and, and it's not like I can just replace the S3, because they're not capable of doing 2D graphics. Besides, I wouldn't have anything for it to do. 3D games don't really run very well on Socket 5 machines, regardless of which GPU you install. It's not specific to the 3DFX cards. The Verge or Mac64 are plenty powerful for what I want to do with this thing, and as yet, no game I have installed has really wanted 3D acceleration at all. Not to any real extent, except when I do it on purpose in a little while. And the rest of the machine's really too slow to make the most of such games anyway. InState 76, for example, would run really badly on this, regardless of video card versus what a K6 and a GeForce 256 could do for it, so we might as well play it on one of those and save this for 2D games, because it really shines there. That's what a machine like this should be for. And when I say 2D games, I guess you can throw in 2.5D. This thing will pretty much walk uh, early FPS games in sector engines, K5s actually seem to be exceptionally good at that for some reason. I think they can beat the Pentium. It, it feels faster. I might actually have to look into that properly someday. Benchmark-wise, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It keeps pace with the M520, which is quite impressive when you think that that board has pipeline burst cache and the later Intel Triton 2 chipset, and I have the timings quite tight. Plus, it was generally a very quick board, the M520. We're losing a hair because of the extra cash, but we'll ignore that. It's not really affecting anything real world. You, you can't see it. Otherwise, it did score identically, and it might even have edged ahead by a fraction in one or two tests. I guess I'll read the scores out for you quickly. So, 3D Bench scores 80.1, PC Player 31.6, Top Bench a nice round 250 or thereabouts. Speed Sys reports 120.94 for the CPU, 176 for the hard drive. Memory bandwidth was at around 154 meg, seems to be about right. Memory throughput is about 66 megs per second. It's about 187 megs per second for the level 1 data cache. Doom finishes its time demo in 1567 ticks, which is around 47.66 frames per second. Quirk is obviously a little slower at 23.9. These are all pretty much in the ballpark for a K5166 machine. It's not really edging into anything special, but it's not really going slow either. It's, it's sitting there nicely, pretty much exactly where it should be.
Now, whilst I might be able to get a marginal boost in scores by reverting to the 256k of cash and tightening the timings up a bit more, it wouldn't really yield anything noticeable here. Besides, you really do get the feeling that this is approaching the upper limits of this motherboard and the SIS5510 chipset in general. CPUs of this speed weren't actually supported when the build came out and it required a BIOS update from over two years later to be flashed to the ROM before it could detect it properly. You're probably not going to go much faster in one of these without doing some really awkward modifications or using strange adapters and by then you'd probably do better to move up to a Triton 2 board or some other AMX capable platform with applicable processor. That 5 VGM board I mentioned would be good for that sort of thing, but that's really not my bag here. I wanted a K5 system out of this, and that's exactly what I got. This board's absolutely brilliant. There is a last note to make about the motherboard, and it's a quirk I have noticed, and a fatal one. If you get one of these, pull this bias flash voltage jumper off. For some reason the SCSI BIOS initialization activates the right pin for the BIOS EEPROM and copies itself into the first half of the ROM, leaving you with a non-starting motherboard. This problem can be solved simply by pulling that flash voltage selection jumper off, preventing the chip from entering programming mode. I'm not clear where this bug comes from or what causes it. Perhaps my board is defective somehow or my SCSI card is. I didn't investigate it and don't really have the tools or skills to do so satisfactorily, so we'll never likely know. To be honest, there's no need to have that jumper in place unless you're flashing the bias in the board anyway, so really there's no harm in taking that off. Just leave it hanging on one pin in case you do need it later. If I had to guess what the problem is, I'd say that as inboard flashing was quite new at the time, something non-standard was probably put in place that gets triggered by the option ROM for whatever reason. I don't know why, maybe an overlapping address, but otherwise it doesn't seem to be causing any other problems. Anyway, other than some small hiccups like that in getting this thing to run, although I guess I'd have been screwed if I didn't have an EEPROM programmer, and of course one or two little hiccups that you can expect with any machine really, it has done nothing but work from the start. Hell, it was being streamed live to the internet before the lid was ever even screwed onto it, and I wasn't running bus termination for the hard drive, which could have ended disastrously. It did show up, I think, between the second and third stream maybe? That did get rectified quickly, there is a Terminator on there now. The hard drive is an IBM DFHS, a double height 3.5 inch drive with a 4 gigabyte capacity, which would have been pretty huge in its time. It uses a SCSI interface and it runs at a whopping 7200 RPM, which would have been very high speed when it came out. It can sure as hell shift data when it wants to as well. It's loud though, and it gets quite hot. Actually, this whole machine runs hot, something I've noticed with faster K5s. So, between the hard drive, CPU, TV card, the VGA card, this thing doubles up as a fairly good space heater. I don't mind so much, because it does good stuff with that power. It has that K5 snappiness about it. I don't know what it is. K5s, they, they have this responsiveness to them when you're running the right applications. Which just so happen to be the applications I want to run quite often, so that's probably one of the reasons I like them so much. Honestly, for Socket 5 systems, I much prefer the K5 over a Pentium. There are a few trade-offs, but I genuinely find myself having more fun with these overall. It doesn't hurt, though, to have a Pentium MX if you want to fill the gap between the K5 and K6, though. Now, before we move on to running some games... I guess it would be cruel of me not to show you what that hard drive actually sounds like.
So it is really quite impressive. I really like the noise this thing makes. It, you know it's working. No doubt about that. Also, it does make a very interesting noise when Speedsys is running some of the drive tests. Yeah, you can actually hear the pitch changing as the head moves farther out. Anyways, running some games. It goes without saying that this machine can absolutely walk things like Dark Forces, just like the old one. As I said, K5s seem to be very good at 2.5D engines. And remember, these use entirely integer math, so the K5's slower floating point performance than the Pentium just doesn't matter here. Even then, it has decent floating point performance but in integer it's actually very good i think it might actually outpace the equivalent pentium in this field it can even run the blood alpha at 640 by 480 quite well though that's stretching it a bit and you will get the occasional slowdown due to how heavy the game can be at that resolution it's not very well optimized blood though amusingly the alpha does run better than the final i wonder if our ranting programmer friend here is to blame Obviously stuff like Descent is an absolute breeze for it. And terminal velocity is a little bit heavier, but it runs absolutely great. to interrupt here for just a moment because I actually wrote that part of the script before recording the footage from the system. Although obviously I'd already used the machine quite heavily so I knew what to expect so that's why I didn't need to be there testing it the whole time. However you might notice the game's not running right, there's something gone wrong with the display and that is actually happening. However I'm not really concerned because most of my time running that game was done before installing the S3 Varge. And I think it's probably just some kind of conflict between one of those undocumented addresses on a diamond card and that TV card. And whilst it shouldn't be doing that, I think it's likely the cause, because I can't find anything to suggest there's a problem with the machine itself or the video card. And I imagine it'll go away when I put the Mac 64 back in. It ran fine when the Mac 64 was in there before. And I, I was thinking, ah, oh, this is one of them things, it's probably going to take me like 10 years to actually get around to changing the cards back. This might just be the motivation I need, because yeah, it's a good system for playing time of velocity. We can get around the problem for now by running the Varge version, which, yeah, I'm surprised it works. I mean, it does need specifically a Varge 325, I believe. It won't work on the later ones. At least I've had no luck with it, but then usually it won't even run on the 325s. My old K5 couldn't run this version. And it does actually work, but the textures look far lower resolution, the sub-pixel calculation is just awful, if not non-existent. It's certainly very sloppy, and I... I wouldn't really recommend that version. It was only an experimental release. It was never properly officially supported or anything. So we might give that a miss. And I, I'm not concerned about this issue at all. I, it, I'm 
100% confident that it will go away as soon as we change the video card back. I can't find anything wrong with the system at all. Quite the opposite, in fact. Broken Sword 2 is problem free, as to be expected. The animations are smooth, the dialogue loads fast enough. Nothing wrong with this at all. The panties I'd found in Nico's bag were just what I needed to wrap around the hot cylinder. The cylinder gave out a faint hiss as the valve opened. Huh? Now I had one primed up and ready to use extinguisher. Atlantis Lost Tales, on the other hand, it drags its heels a bit, but that was a given. We already know it, the system requirements on its box aren't accurate. You really need a mid tier K6 to play this, I've found. I'd actually claim it to be playable on this for the most part for me, but the audio is going to lose sync and you really would benefit from a K6 or Pentium 2 for this game. I, I wouldn't bother playing it on a Pentium 1 or K5, it's just not the most fun experience you can have with it. It's not showing the game at its best. Grand Theft Auto doesn't run too badly. This is the Windows version, the DOS version will run better than this. I always did find it a little bit slow in Windows GTA, and sometimes it goes too fast if you've got a very powerful machine. Flight Unlimited runs quite comfortably, we're at 640 by 480 it's going to slow down a bit if we start being really silly, but it's not too bad. I'm quite happy with this performance. Also, my joystick wasn't working right, I'm not sure what was wrong with it. I think maybe it's getting a bit old, I might need to clean the potentiometers. I really should crash that plane, huh? Also, Little Big Adventure 2, as I mentioned, it runs okay for the most part, but the video cutscenes are absolutely terrible, and they're still not really any better if I shrank the screen. I'm not sure what the hell's wrong with it. it I don't remember it running this bad on machines before, but maybe it did. I haven't played this game for years. No problem. I'm I'm sure I'll just play it on something faster than this. The game itself doesn't run that badly, and to be honest, it's a noteworthy game, if only for the fact that it's the only one I know of where you can kick a pregnant woman in the stomach. Oh, and children as well. 
outside is horrible, the teacher said I could jump rope in the classroom. See? Yeah, play jump rope. How's about we play another game? We'll play some fucking darts, you little shit. Brute. And elephants. Yeah, come here, you fucking elephant bastard. I'll fucking show you, you fucking dickhead. You fucking... Another fucking Dumbo looking piece of fucking. Oh crap. He's actually kind of mad. I mean, geez, man, not even the bards are safe in this game. Little Big Adventure 2 might just be the most violent video game ever released, and it came out the same year as Grand Theft Auto. Somehow nobody seems to have noticed. They noticed it came out, they just didn't notice the violence. I guess it looks cartoony enough. That's something for you. Also, there's something I've noticed, and it's very problematic. Grand Theft Auto 1 allows you to play as a woman. Why isn't anybody complaining that you can't do this in the later games? That's a completely sexist of the developers, and I'm very disappointed in Rockstar for completely omitting this feature from later games. Then again, I suppose there are more pressing issues, because last I checked, all of my garbage collectors were still men. So there we go, that's my new K5. I already loved this thing from the start. It's like having my old TMC board back, but maybe even better. It's just one of those systems that it did nothing but work from its inception, and I hope it keeps doing so for years to come. I've had some rough luck with boards up to now, largely due to using scrap parts in the past that had had terrible lives, and because of people damaging things, but I have a feeling that this time I've got it right, and... I don't think I'll be swapping this one out any time soon. I sure hope so anyway, because I love this thing. It's absolutely great. It's the K5 I always wanted, and as much as I love the M520 that I had running, if anything had to replace it, well, I'm glad it was this, because it has just been absolutely fantastic up until this point. And I can't really think of any way to improve it either, which is generally a good thing. Aside from swapping that video card back, but it doesn't really change the performance any. So there's not really any point in me doing that now and demonstrating it. I'll just get around to it when I get round to it, I guess. So I think that about covers it. It's a K5, and as usual, I really like it. There. Yeah, it probably would start getting a little bit slow if we pushed it much farther, especially once things start getting more floating point intensive, but the same would probably happen with a Pentium or a Cyrix chip. I think my channel and other channels have definitely covered the differences between these CPUs, so that's why I didn't go into so much technical detail here. If you would like me to make another one on that and you think my old one's outdated and crap or something, do let me know. I'd actually be willing to have another go at that maybe finally motivate me into getting an MP6 because I still haven't gotten one of those but that's not really important right now as usual I don't know what I'll be doing next you know I will get odds and sods done but I don't know when and I need some stuff to do all of it anyway nothing major I just need like some discs and that and it's, it's not a big deal I'll get there but you know, one of the things we've not been like some big network partner channel with contracts and schedules to oblige. I do sort of just do what I feel like doing at the time. I might change my mind, so, you know, that's why I never really give an order. On the other end, I don't think we're out of stuff to do yet. I might just have one or two, like, tricks left up my sleeve as to interesting things we can do here in the future. So... Who knows? Who knows what the future holds? You never really can be certain. Even I'm not most of the time, as I've just said. Anyway, uh, I think that's about it. There's not really much else to say here. Uh, other than, remember when I said something big might be happening? Well, it's still not, but it's starting to look like it may happen at some point. And obviously that might get in the way of things. But you'll know about it if it does. I, I will tell you all about it, so... And if it doesn't happen, then we'll just carry on as best we can. You know, it won't get in the way, so it probably won't affect anything if it doesn't. You'll know about it. Anyways, 
and my trees and thanks for watching and I will see you again next time. And remember, be a pro, use DOS 5.0. Fuck's sake, I think it's worse. <laughs>